Incline thine ear upon us, O Lord, and hear our prayers. Amen. I am thankful for the opportunity to share some words with you again this day. Rules always has its challenges. I'll tell the people in the first service, a lot of times I got to preach long enough so the choir can get here if they're going to sing uh, just at the end of the service. But now with the second service, the challenge is just, just to make sure you get out in time for lunch. <laughs> but let us share together these moments. As we continue in the season of Easter, we look at the benefits of Easter that are ours of the children of God, those things that we enjoy. Pastor Blaine was talking about that. He was talking about our restoration with God, talking about new life, the life in the spirit, and even today, salvation, and then eternal life. And what that means for us as we go forward and we live all that God has given to us through the blessings of Easter morning. A couple of short lessons today. John 3.16 helps us to understand that God really, really loves us. When someone has said to you, have you ever responded with, do you really mean that? Do you really love me? Sometimes when people have said they love us and they care for us, in the back of our mind, do we have that little pinch of doubt? Are they just saying that to make me feel good? Well, God really, really loves us. In that the state of the world was to a point where he knew the only thing he could do was send his own son. And that he should suffer and be the sacrifice. The only person who could do that so that we might be saved from our sins, that we would not be condemned, but the world would be saved. And that Ephesian passage puts it quite simply, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Do we realize that every hour past Easter is a gift? And sometime in there, God is gifting us something, no cost. But he just keeps pouring them on for us. Sometimes they may be great. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes we don't even know they're there. And sometimes we're tickled plumb to death. But God's grace is there. Now, I will say today's sermon is going to be a little more of a preaching sermon, not so much some of my storytelling times. But we'll get through it. I was in junior high. You know, in junior high, we had a Bible club, and it met once a week. The leaders of the Bible club were a couple of our Sunday school teachers, and sometimes they would pick us up, or if we could walk, we'd walk, we'd go to their homes, and we'd share some time together. Well, one of those meetings that we were at, one of the leaders looked at me, and she said, Tommy, are you saved and sanctified? Well, the first thing that hit me was, I was too old to be called Tommy. Yeah. It was that point in my life when that name was starting to drive me crazy. But one of the leaders and her younger redheaded sister, all through high school, they always called me Tommy. You know what it's like walking down the, high, the hall of a high school and somebody calls you Tommy? But anyhow, you know, I gave some thought to the question that she had just asked. Well, you know, I knew what saved was. No, you ask God for forgiveness, you confess your sins, you take him into your heart, you make that turnaround, and you head towards Jesus every day. But I had no idea what sanctified was, or what sanctification was. It'd be a couple of years later in eighth grade when that would come home to me, when at that time I answered God's call upon my life to go into full-time ministry. And I know that I had been touched by the Spirit, and now the Spirit was totally guiding my life. And all that I was going to be, all that God wanted me to be, because He was walking with me. He had set me aside. He was walking with me every day. But having no idea what sanctification was, I didn't want to seem ignorant. So I simply looked at the leader and said, yep, I got it all. <laughs> Salvation and sanctification are the benefits of the other side of Easter. 
It's that new life creation that we become in Christ. We are made new over again. Salvation is when we realize the sinful life we have been living without Jesus every day. And we come to the moment where we ask God for forgiveness, when we're washed by the blood of Jesus, and we seek to have a living relationship with God every day. And that sanctification or sanctifying moment is where we begin to mature in our faith. Sometimes we call it the second work of grace. You know, we're filled with the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. God is our Savior. And we're led by the Spirit. But then as we grow and we learn, hopefully we mature to the point where Jesus is not only our Savior, but now he becomes our Lord and Savior. He's the one that leads me. He's the one that I listen to. He's the one that guides me in all that I am doing. So if we go back a little bit, we may have to ask ourselves, why did Easter ever have to happen why did Easter morning come you know I was a member one time of an evangelism team in college every once in a while we would get a preacher a teacher a musician and a couple of others and we go to different churches for the weekend and we preach Friday night we're usually with the kids Saturday night we'd have a, a cover dish or a potluck and then Sunday we would do the preaching well it's Saturday night at the potluck dinner because I was going to be the preacher you know, I was going around and encouraging everybody to come back tomorrow. And I said, Ian, when you come back tomorrow, why don't you bring a friend with you? You know, remember Pastor Blaine last week was talking about sermon titles and how they can change in the middle of the week and really what does a sermon title mean? Why am I putting it on the top of the page? You know, what am I advertising? You know, what's the hook, you know, to get you here? Well, I wanted the people to come. So I figured, you know, I better come up with something that's really going to tweak their interest. So Saturday night I told them, you come back tomorrow because I'm going to tell you three things that God does not know. There are three things that God does not know. You want to get some Indiana Baptist interested? You know, <laughs> you tell them. But I said, you come back tomorrow and I'll let you know what those three things are. First thing God doesn't know, he doesn't know one person without sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why Jesus had to come and be the sacrifice. That's why he came in a human likeness without sin. So he could be offered up. Not one is without sin. And the second thing that God does not know he doesn't know any other way to heaven but through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Have you been washed by the blood? One of those old hymns we used to sing. See, folks, it's not a hundred hours of community service. It's not buying a pew for the church or faithfully giving to the nonprofits. It's not being the best person ever that you can be, always willing to help one another. For Romans 8, 3, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. Or 1 John 1, but if you walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin doesn't know a person without sin doesn't know any other way but through Jesus and he doesn't know any better time than right now now could be the moment to ask for forgiveness now could be the moment to walk with Jesus because it tells us in the days to come People are only going to have an ear to what they really want to hear. They're not going to be interested in hearing the gospel message or anything that might bring them the fullness of life. Second Timothy 3 puts it this way. 
You must understand this, that in the last days distressing times will come. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, slanderers, brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid them. If anyone is not walking with God, if anyone is not seeking the forgiveness, God knows of no better time for that to happen than right now. A confession in our own book of worship, we believe man has fallen from righteousness and apart from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, is destitute of holiness, inclined to evil. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In his own strength, without divine grace, man cannot do good works pleasing and acceptable to God. The reality of sin that infects us constitutes the reason that Jesus had to come and for his death and for his resurrection. So was the state at that time, and so it is with much of the world today. But you know, there is a verse of Scripture that should be music to our ears. It's John 3.16. Can you say those words with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. And don't ever forget to read verse 17, kind of like the, the missing cousin. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Or think about 1 Timothy 1. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Because we have within us that sinful nature, that thing that's going to try to keep us from walking faithfully with God. So with these words, we can move into the other side of Easter and the benefit that Easter has for us. For see, when the awakening happens in our life and we are moved to surrender our life to God, we come to that moment in Christian teachings which is called the conversion experience or salvation. And when we read the scriptures, we find the root meaning of conversion is to turn around or to change directions to get out of where we're going now. The Apostle Paul wrote, describing conversion as one of the most distinguished teachings of the Christian faith. 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything has become new. Even the Encyclopedia of World Methodism defines as part of God's revealed purpose to bring people by divine grace and human response into a conscious and life-giving relationship with God himself. Divine grace, human response, living with God. And Wesley would write, sin is remitted and pardon is applied to the soul, but a divine faith wrought by the Holy Spirit who then begins the great work of inward sanctification going on to perfection. Conversion is the life transforming experience by which we come into the family of God, by which we come to be called Christians because we follow Christ. It's a conscious decision. It's the act of a person who wants to turn away from their sins. It is a conversion that we participate in by faith the redemptive powers of Jesus. Where we affirm his leadership and lordship, we follow into the body of Christ. We are the family of God. It's a process of moral transformation where we renew in ourselves again the image of God. 
Think about that. When we leave the front door every day, will people be able to see the image of God and what we're doing and who we are? Scripture teaches that conversion is the fundamental prerequisite for entrance into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom or heaven. Some conversions are sudden and dramatic. Paul with a bl blinding light. The Philippian jailer when the earthquake came. Some were kind of unspectacular. The Ethiopian eunuch sitting in his chariot reading scriptures. Or Lydia, one of the great ladies of scripture. But both John the baptizer and Jesus would begin their public ministry with a statement. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come. So part of that salvation, part of that conversion then is the repentance. To repent means to turn from your ways and follow now God's way. The Old Testament many times God was offering to the sinning nations to repent and change their directions. But when we move into the New Testament, the focus comes off of national repentance. Lord knows we still need that. But it goes now to the individual repentance. Old Testament to go in the opposite direction. New Testament to reserve one's course. So we see the teaching of conversion and salvation involves a repentance of asking for God's direction and going a different way. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And do you realize that the New Testament begins and ends in Matthew 3 and Revelation 3 with a call to repent. Our book of discipline affirms because God truly loves us in spite of our willful sin, God judges us, summons us to repentance, pardons us, receives us by grace given to us in Jesus Christ, and gives hope to us of life eternal. But there's another emphasis of repentance we cannot forget. It doesn't end at the moment of conversion. Think again about the words of the Lord's Prayer. Remember where it says, forgive us our debts? It indicates that there is a need for an ongoing repentance, that we should repent for our failures to live obediently and faithfully each and every day of life. John Wesley rightly insisted, we must repent before we can believe the gospel. We must be cut off from dependency upon ourselves before we can truly depend on Christ. So we have that conversion, we have that moment of salvation, and faith plays a large part in that turning around. Because, see, we accept the truth of the Scriptures. We depend on Jesus to make it all real to us. We become the believers believers in Christ because without a personal faith in Jesus we cannot be saved Wesley said grace is the source faith the condition of salvation and John 6 will tell us then they said to him what must we do to perform the works of God and Jesus said this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent and again, go to our book of discipline. Through faith in Jesus, we are forgiven, reconciled to God, and transformed as the people of the new covenant, the new life. Saving faith, though, is more than just an emotional thing where we get all teary-eyed or happy or we have that warm, heartfelt experience because emotions aren't always reliable. But it is faith led by Scripture that will consist of a sincere conviction and a decision that I am going forward depending on Jesus. Faith brings us to the basic human needs of forgiveness, of acceptance, of a divine assistance in our lives. 
How many times in praise do we sing out, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was found, but blind, but now I see. The book of discipline, we believe God reaches out to the repentant believer in justifying grace with accepting and pardoning life. God is our creator. But until we have that personal faith experience with Jesus, we don't enjoy the privilege of truly being the sons and daughters of God. Romans 5, God proves his love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ that through him we have now received reconciliation. The experience of conversion restores us into a fellowship with God and brings us to a place of peace. But many times we need to ask ourselves, how do I receive forgiveness? How do I receive the conversion of the salvation experience? How do I live the benefits of Easter going forward? Go to the central thinkings of our biblical revelations, the thought of grace. Grace means God's unmerit favor doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Grace comes in so many ways. It is with us from the moment of birth and it stays with us until the time of death. We depend upon God's grace for every aspect of our life. And without grace in this world, without God's grace, the world would fall into an even deeper disarray and chaos. So God's grace works in the highest form at the point of our greatest needs, the need of deliverance from sin and spiritual death. And salvation is not a human achievement. It is a divine work. Block yourself in on that. Salvation is not a human achievement, but a divine work. Redemption does not rest on our ancestry, our social class, our personal efforts, any person or organization. John 1 said it quite simply. It is the work of God. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Through grace we find release from the spiritual darkness and we're reconciled once again to God. 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. God's working and saving power is the grace that he gives to us. It's a grace that brings us to the thought of being, being, being raised from the dead, of living Romans 8. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. As we understand grace, more and more we can understand God. How the scripture teaches us that it is through God's love that this undeserving favor is ours. As he does something that we could never do for ourselves. And he is not hindered by our resistance. He'll keep coming after us to lead us to that personal experience to be that new image the image of God. And again, grace doesn't depend on any human merit or achievement. It's just because God loves you. It means now that we live a life that reveals mercy and loving kindness and goodness. It is the covenant that God gives to us. In the Old Testament, they would proclaim, because your steadfast grace is better than life, my lips will praise you. Do we live in his grace? Will our lips confess him to all the world? Grace cannot be earned. It's just yours. And our response should simply be this. 
thankful praise, holy living, and loving your neighbors and loving others as yourself. We ponder your steadfast grace, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the end of the earth. In the Old Testament, we found grace in the word charisma, simply meaning free gift of grace, that every day God has a new gift for us. It's like an unending Christmas. There'll be a package, there'll be a gift every day there for us to open freely. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. It's not your doing, it's the gift of God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord. We learn from the scripture that God extends his grace towards everyone. No one stands outside the circle of God's grace. For he invites all to come. For God so loved the world. So it's quite simple. It is us confessing that we are sinners and that we stand in the need of God's grace. The modern world is going to tell you to ignore that idea. They're going to ask you to rationalize your wrongdoing. Hang it on somebody else. Shift your blame for your transgressions onto society or stress or education or any family situation. But it cannot be. For once we have come to the awakening and know the need for salvation, now we've got to grow in grace. God's grace is undivided. It precedes salvation as prevenient grace. It continues as a justifying grace. And it's brought to fruition in the sanctifying grace. The restoration of God's image in our lives renews us from a fallen state. Wesley would say in a sermon, it was free. Grace formed us out of the dust of the ground and breathed into us a living soul and stamped on us that soul the image of God and put all things under our feet. Today, we celebrate the Easter season and we do so as blessed people. For while we were still sinners, he would send his son. He'd be the complete sacrifice for salvation. And he continues to walk us and keep us as a new creation because of the Holy Spirit. So a good question to ponder for us is how do we continue to live God's grace on the other side of Easter? Paul has got some great guidance for us. Go to Romans 6, those 14 verses. Do you know that he says when we've come to the moment of salvation, when we live by grace, when we are that new creation, we are called to, we are obligated to live the life of the Spirit. Because Paul knew that every day we will struggle with sin, we will struggle with the law, we will struggle with death. But we have been freed by the grace of God, even for those moments when we struggle. For there is no condemnation, despite our guilt. Romans 6, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We have that new life. We experience being released from the law and from sin. We live under a whole new principle, the Spirit of life and not death. The Spirit will sanctify, lead, witness to, and intercede for us. And we've got a great joy in that in any moment that we feel we're falling back, we're heading towards that sinful old self, we are endued with a power from on high to stamp out and travel it underfoot. Do you realize any moment that we feel like we're falling away, we can shout out, get thee behind me, Satan. That's the authority and the power that we take with us after Easter morning. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Whoever sows to please the Spirit 
from the Spirit will reap eternal life. That Romans 6, but if Christ is in you, then though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. We find the grace of God again and a vibrant living relationship with God. And then that Romans 6, 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Paul flat out says that we have an obligation to no longer live according to the flesh or a life of sin. We need to change our priorities and we need to change our focus. And in that 14th verse, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Let me tell you, the forces of evil are not happy because of all the benefits of Easter that we have received because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we move forward, we must walk each day covered by the grace of God. We must walk each day led by the Spirit. Saved and sanctified, we have the authority of God to walk a new life through Christ alone. And perhaps we can each ask ourselves that question. Are you saved and sanctified? Are you walking each day with Jesus? We all can because of Easter morning. Father God, we just give you praise and thanks for the glorious day of Easter. But Lord, we know that days move on. The days that Jesus went back and spoke with the disciples, the day that Peter was, was born again, because he could cry out, Lord, you know I love you. And Lord, so there is some living for us to do in the days after Easter. It's coming to the point where we know that we need you when we make that confession, where we receive your cleansing blood, and that that salvation leads us to a life full of the Spirit, to the day that you sanctify us and we know you as our Savior but we follow you as our Lord every day. Lord, make this, these things happen so that every day after Easter may be the greatest day for living as we live it through the grace of God. Amen.